uh, everybody. Sorry. Um, it's wonderful to have so many of you back. Um, I know it's early on a Saturday morning for many of us here, at least in the United States. And thank you to everybody else who's joining us internationally. We're still waiting on one of our panelists to come. Inshallah, he'll be with us in not too long. Um, but uh, I think what we'll do is go ahead and get started. Since some of you may not have been here um, the first time, um, I'll go ahead and introduce our first panelist um, again. Um, her name is Farah El Sharif, and she's a PhD student at Harvard University's Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations Department. Her research focuses on the modern 19th and 20th century intellectual, mystical, and legal history of West Africa and the Levant. Farah completed her undergraduate degree in culture and politics at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service in 2009 and received her MA from the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California in 2013. She is currently working on a dissertation on the Rimah of al Hajj Umar Futital, um, and her presentation um, is on a bit of her work entitled Inter Authors in the Thalq Sphere, the Prominence of Early Ottoman Egyptian Scholarship in the Kitab al Rimah. And uh, I think one of the um, hidden blessings, I guess, is that the presentation was so good and I was really enjoying it the first time. Uh, and so I'm grateful that we'll actually get to hear a little bit more about it this morning. Uh, and so with that, Farah, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Deji. Uh, good morning and salams to everybody. Uh, yes, indeed, the, I, like I said before, the Kitab Rimah can be a bit of a corrosive, uh, powerful text. So um, if the conditions weren't, you know, 100%, then, you know, they, they needed to be the case. And it seems, alhamdulillah, today they are. Um, and thank you for the people who are going to be hearing the the beginning of this or half of the presentation again today. There will be a quiz about what I said uh, because you'll be hearing it twice. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but thank you for uh, um, being here, uh, everybody. And I hope it will be a fruitful panel for, for everyone. So, Bismillahir um, Rahmanir Rahim, Sallallahu Alaihi Sayyidina Muhammad. I'm going to be discussing today a chapter from my dissertation. But before I do so, uh, if I may, I'd like to give a little bit of a background on um, Sheikh Omar and the Rimah, just, just so we have some background info that, that we need to kind of contextualize um, what is being uh, discussed today. So the title of my talk is Inter-Authors in the Dhawq Sphere and the Prominence of Early Ottoman Egyptian Scholarship in Kitab Rimah. Sheikh Omar Futi Tal was among the most prominent, influential, and erudite West African scholars of the 19th century. He was born on the border between modern-day Senegal and Mauritania to a family that emphasized the pursuit of Islamic classical scholarship from a young age. He was a prodigy. He quickly excelled in the, in the memorization and the study of the Quran and jurisprudence and attained sort of a mastery in many Islamic sciences uh, from a young age. He was initiated into the Tijani order in Futa Jalon, uh, close to the border of modern day Mauritania uh, by Abdul Karim and Naqil via uh, Mawlud Fal, who are from the Hafiziya branch of um, the Egyptian branch of the Tijani. Um, so he uh, performed Hajj in 1827, and this Hajj uh, journey would quickly change his life because that is where he met um, uh, one of the Khalifas of uh, Sheikh Ahmed Tijani was a direct companion of him. His name was uh, Sheikh Muhammad Al Ghali. Um, and after a tutelage, uh, so a mentorship, a relationship for more than five years, they became so so close. Um, and Sheikh Muhammad Al Ghali designated him as the Khalifa of the Tijaniya in West Africa. After his master died, he returned to West Africa and quickly began to amass a large number of followers. Later on in his life, he would found a so-called Umarian Caliphate. It was brief, but this state covered substantial portions of modern day countries such as Mali, Senegal, and Guinea, encompassing a landmass as large as Western Europe. His saintly authority um, was considered unrivaled in his time. Many of his fo many followers flocked to seek assistance through his hands that were um, perceived to be charged with barakah. 
uh, oral narratives relay stories about his many karamat, his miracles, which included successful prayers for rain, uh, victory in battle, and resistance to harm despite never carrying a weapon. Uh, just one, one stare. We could have used uh, that powerful stare uh, in our last panel to, to, to get rid of the, uh, the rogue um, interrupters. Anyway, his spiritual authority in the Tijaniya make him one of the Tariqa's elite saints. His legacy is cemented through his continued popularity uh, in the Tijaniya in West Africa. Some communities to this day in Northern Eastern Senegal, such as in Medina Gunas, consider him the ultimate Khalifa. Um, unfortunately, more contemporary inter Tariqa rivalry also play a part in diminishing um, the prominence of, of the Rimah. So between his return from Hajj, uh, he spent uh, eight years in Sokoto Caliphate as a guest of Uthman Danfodio's son, Muhammad Bello, where he's thought to have begun writing the Rimah there in, in the court of Uthman Danfodio. Eight years later, after he amassed sort of a following and a, and a community in Jigunko, um, he completed the Rimah in eight, 1845. Um, so, Numerous copies of the Imah were transcribed and distributed widely uh, throughout his sojourns and his travels across his, uh, among his disciples. And this helped spread the text. Um, this text would ultimately become the second doctrinal reference in the Tariqa Tijaniya after the Jawah al-Ma'ani of Sheikh Ahmed Tijani, which was transcribed to his disciple, Ali Harazim Barada. And in turn, it's important to note that half of the quotes of Sheikh Ibrahim Niyas's magnum opus, the Kashf al Ilbas, come from the Rimah. So many regard Sheikh Omar's legacy as a precursor or a heralder to the Faida, or even the first bearer in West Africa. Printed versions of the Rimah are normally found on the margins. I have a picture of that, let's show you on the margins of the Jawahir of Ahmed Tijani, making both books the Ummahat, uh, Al-Kutub of the, of the Tariqa, of you know, arguably the largest Sufi order in Africa. Um, so I, in, in my recent visit to Medina by Senegal, I asked the uh, Imam of the Grand Mosque there, uh, Imam uh, Tijani Sise about the Rimah. And, and he said, unfortunately, it's not as, um, you know, uh, the attention uh, on it should be more because it's literally marginalized, uh, and uh, it needs to be taken seriously as its own text. People assume that because it's on the margin, this is some kind of commentary. It's not. So, um, and this is also due to the fact that more academic attention has been paid to Tal's life as a warrior and not as a serious intellectual, which is very funny because he, his jihad was only 10 years long at the end of his life, but for 50 years or so prior, he was dedicated solely to writing and teaching and traveling. Not to mention that a lack of a full English translation of the Rimah constitutes a major academic blind spot in the study of modern Islamic studies, Sufi studies, West African intellectual history and African studies. So while it is arguably the most important 19th century um, text in West Africa, it is important to remember that it is certainly not unique in its genre of Islamic scholarly literature from West Africa in Arabic. Let us remember that it is only a drop in the ocean of the Islamic and Arabic scholarship. And the extent of this tradition is well documented thanks to the efforts of historians and Africanists such as uh, John Hunwick, Professor Khan, uh, Rudiger Seisman, and R.S. Ofehi and others. Um, in 1995, um, Islamic Africa specialist uh, John Hunwick lamented that the book lies unstudied by Africanists and Islamicists like a hard lump in the stomach, massive and undigested. Two decades later, although increasing scholarship has been made and strides have been made in this regard, unfortunately, this is still largely the case. Uh, it is my opinion that the Rimah deters scholars from studying it closely because it comprises of a large volume of direct quotations, half of which come from 15th century Egyptian scholars. One of the central question my dissertation asks then, why the works of Sha'rani and Suyuti factor so heavily into this West African revivalist text. 
For the purposes of this presentation, I will focus today on the theme of inter-authorship and the approach that Sheikh Omar uses to curate his magnum opus with copious quotes, half of which come from Imam Sha'arani and what that means for West African Islamic intellectual history. I find this quote by Professor um, uh, Dr. John Locke Willis, uh, an Orientalist who wrote about Sheikh Omar Futi, uh, very, very helpful for the purposes of understanding our presentation today. So I'll read it very quickly. Contrary to what one might have reasonably expected, the Sheikh does not appear to have found the germ of much of his thought in the teachings of Ahmed Tijani, but rather in the writings of Sufi mystic, canonist, theologian, biographer, Abdul Wahab Sha'arani. Indeed, it now seems certain that a careful study of the Egyptians' writing is of utmost importance for any understanding of the Islam intellectual currents of Sudanese Islam. As prior mentioned, um, there's almost 640 to 650 direct quotes um, in, in the Rimah. Of these, more than half come from Sha'arani. So what is it about the scholar that has Sheikh Omar so captivated? Uh, in, the, in his most recent book on Islamic realization in the 18th century, Professor Zakiri Wright discusses the influence of West African scholars on Egyptian and Moroccan scholars to show that networks of intellectual exchange between North Africa and specifically Egypt and West Africa were a two-way street rather than the impression that West African scholars were only on the receiving end of these new ideas. Uh, for example, uh, you should look at um, Amr Saeed's dissertation on Sheikh Omar Futi. He writes about his other written works. And he shows how, um, for example, uh, Imam Suyuti had a very strong relationship with West African scholars and gave them fatawa. And he had a good relationship with a, with a ruler named Hajj uh, uh, Askiya Muhammad. And um, he also shows how um, Sheikh Omar went into the habit of copying a lot of their manuscripts in Cairo. Uh, he calls this an uh, art artifact of epistemology, which I like. Anyhow, so three centuries later, Sheikh Omar would be one of those scholars who would stop and remain for a lengthy time in Cairo on his way to Hajj, copying such manuscripts. But there is evidence to suggest that he was already studying Sha'arani and Suyuti in Futa Jalon in um, before he even left uh, West Africa, but that's for another day. So Sha'arani, who is a Shafi, died in 1565. His seminal work, Al-Mizan al-Kubra, The Supreme Scale, in it he compares the rulings of all four Sunni legal schools of Sharia as if they were one single school. And this seemed to have really left a mark on Sheikh Omar. Sha'arani can easily be regarded as the intellectual and spiritual soulmate or twin of Omar Futi Ta, whose ideas become synthesized in a new and masterful way in the Rimah. So instead of uh, looking at um, the quotes as massive lumps, I argue that the primary use of quotations needs to be taken very seriously as its own mode of knowledge transmission and corpus design. Um, this is a, an image of the Mizan al-Kubra in printed form. Um, this is the study of uh, Professor uh, Ghatta, who, who did a study um, sort of on the quotations, on the sources of the Rimah. So um, you can see up there how much more um, than anybody else is Sha'arani is heavily prominent. From my close readings of the text, it is clear that Sheikh Omar uses quotes from Awliya not to legitimate or endorse his project for utilitar utilitarian aims to gain power, but he does so foremost in a nod of approximation to the Janab, to the Hadra of these people, uh, in reverence and respect for the intellectual production of Muslim sages across time and space, and to show the combined strength of works, of the works and utterances of spiritual ancestors. Indeed, it is inconceivable to consider that someone with Hajj Omar's sheer erudition and mastery uh, of uh, religious sciences in the Arabic language that he could not do away with being sort of the sole author of the Rimah, even though this idea of author is uh, 
a problematic one, as I will explain. So contemporary scholars have debated, discussed the problematic of authorship and the contours of copyright and the issue of giving credit to a singular creative genius. The issue of copyright and authorship in Sufi writings has been studied, uh, for example, in the case of a paper by Michael Fershkopf, who, um, bless him, uh, Dr. Oludamini uh, guided me to this. I must thank him for that. Uh, he argues for an approach of reading Sufi poetry as coming from a social network of inter-authors. He says, the best Sufi authors draw near to each other. And here in this quote I have, for, for Sufi spiritual greatness can only mean connection. Uh, so we can't uh, sort of impose our modern uh, sort of um, Western canon ideas of authorship on uh, sort of the Islamic corpus of, of, of Sufi um, inter-authorship. Um, this statement can easily be applied to the Rimah. Um, it's, 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 it's almost as if these quotes are, are, very placed, are very well placed intentionally, like they are pieces of a puzzle. Um, it tells us that Sheikh Omar is motivated by sort of an activation of the core tenets of the path to God. Uh, sort of these, uh, picking these gems, these jewels and placing them in the right place. I, I, I argue this might be a bit uh, radical, but if uh, the Ghazali's Ihya Ulum al is the revival of the religious sciences, then and my book, Tal Zrimah, is the revival of Tariq Allah, the revival of the path to God. The use of quotes has to do with forming th synthesis, affinity, approximation, and unification of the corpus of Sufi thought uh, based on a shared experience, uh, what I call the Zawq sphere. So Sheikh Omar and Sharani's relationship is very much experienced by taste in the Zawq sphere. So let's now move on to discuss exactly how those two authors connect. The, I, I uh, basically focus on these uh, five spheres of similarity. Uh, the centrality of the Tariqa Muhammadiya and its methodology, the messianic backdrop for their project, the eschatological undertones, criticism of jurists and taqlid and single madhab affiliation, criticism of immoral rulers and anti-Sultan political views, calls for sober Sufism and criticism of excesses among popular Sufis. So the 16th century puts us at the precise milieu of Imam Suyuti, Ali Khawas, Sha'rani, who emphasized not only visionary experience with the Prophet, but the idea of experiencing fana in him, union in him, by seeing him in a waking state, sometimes at all times, so much so um, that if uh, the Prophet were absent for them for one moment, as Sha'rani cites, uh, 13th century Egyptian Sufi, Sheikh Abu, Abu al-Abbas al-Mursi, the patron saint of Alexandria, uh, I would not count myself from among the Muslims. Perhaps for dramatic effect, yet the motivation behind broadcasting and describing the prevalence of this possibility with such vivacity for these sagely authorities is clear. When one is not exerting him or herself in the constant invocation on the prophet, what implication does this have on a Muslim's claim to faith? According to these sagely authors, there is an obvious existential implication on the spiritual health of one's faith if they do not have a strong living connection to the prophet. Seemingly, the stakes for attaining this connection only get higher by 19th century West Africa. As Sheikh Omar saw it, a need arose for a clearer articulation of what Sufism should look like and what so-called Sufis must undertake. Uh, the curation of quotes and accounts from sages past meeting with the prophet was not written this time for the spiritual elite. It was not meant to be shrouded in a garb of secrecy. This was an invitation for the masses to make the Muhammadan path not only palatable, but central to religious identity. Moving on to the second point of um, the unity of the madahib as a messianic doctrine. 
One of the most powerful features of Shahrani's intellectual legacy is his criticism of the jurists and their flawed and corrupting effects of inter madhab conjecture and bickering. This critical theme towards the conventional fiqh approach is not found, it's not just found in this uh, hugely influential book, Al-Mizan Al-Kubra, which, which I mentioned earlier. Sha'rani also wrote this book called Kashf Al-Ghumma An Jami' Al-Ummah, The Removal of the Falk from the Whole Community, which he wrote as, uh, first of all, as a response to the moral and intellectual corruption and decay he witnessed he witnessed from Fuqaha, um, but he also wrote it sort of as his end of time kind of compendium. And this quote by Adam Sabra, who, ha who has a, a really great book on Sha'rani, he says, Sha'rani was convinced that he was writing a book that would last until the end of time. Uh, even the Mahdi may peace of, uh, be upon him will, will, and his supporters will benefit from it. Similarly, uh, Hajj Umar Tal also believed he was living at a time nearing the end of the world. And some of his followers even thought of him to be the awaited Mahdi. This makes it all the more conceivable that Sheikh Umar's adoption of the Sha'ranian doctrine, which was explicitly written to be a prescription for end time confusion, was something that Sheikh Umar did intentionally in the Rimah as a messianic text. The power and purchase of Sha'rani's project, whether in 19th century Levant or West Africa, become, has become instrumentalized differently by different people, as you can imagine. Uh, Professor Pagani highlights the wide interpretive possibilities when reading Sha'rani's work and their implications on fiqh approaches. For example, the Mizan has been open to a wide range of interpretations. In the 19th century, Conservative ulama with a Sufi background use this text to oppose ijtihad, while Sufi and Salafi reformers used it to support ijtihad. Herein lines the liminal positionality of both Sha'rani and Tal's respective, pro respective projects. Far from being stringent dogmatists, they were both able to criticize ma different manifestations uh, of corrupt features in their respective societies. They could even do um, criticism of self, of their own groups, uh, even or perhaps more so in their own communities of ulama and adherents of Sufi Turuq. Though features of their projects appear to be more championed by anti-Sufis in the modern period, this perhaps indicates that Sheikh Omar and Sha'rani's visions were ultimately never fully fulfilled. Neither authors live to see the impl implementation of a society guided by Mohammedan Sufi way with an anti-authoritarian ethos and one that is largely pluralistic in which the ulama were trained in Gnosticism via a widely recognized Sheikh Wasil, a connecting Sheikh. Though Sheikh Omar Tal's vision certainly came close uh, during his briefly existent state that he founded. This is one of the titles of the chapters uh, of the Rimah that I think uh, kind of echoes this sort of criticism that, that he had for um, so-called blind taqlid. So in conclusion, in this paper, I discussed why it is significant that half of the copious quotes of the Rimah come from Abdul Wahab Sha'rani. In undergoing a serious excavation of the intellectual sources of the Rimah, few studies have barely scratched the surface of Tal's inspiration and influences. Explaining the theoretical concept of inter-authorship in Sufi writings, I argued that Tal's methodology of copious quotation is a way of reinvigorating and refurbishing Sha'rani and other Sufi scholars' overall project in a matter which breathes new life into their works as co-authors of the Tijani doctrine, which saw itself as a final tariqa, just as the prophet was the final messenger. Notwithstanding that heavy quotation is a feature that most Islamic texts share, what distinguishes Sha'rani and Tal's inter-authorial relationship is its strikingly similar approaches to their respective projects that are guided by Gnosticism above all else. I dub this the Dhawq sphere, implying that ideas they write about do not stem from rational 
discourse only, but one that emanates from shared experiential taste, that one you can only experience, that touches on all facets of Islamic knowledge spheres, legal, creedal, or otherwise. Though these two sagely authors live 200 years apart, the two-way intellectual exchange between late Mamluk, early Ottoman Egyptian ulama, and that of West African scholars of that time period, later periods, has been increasingly well-documented and sets up the background for this vibrant cross-regional link. I showed that the heavy provenance of Sha'arani's inter-authorship urges us to turn our attention to understand better Sheikh Omar's project. The emphasis on Tariqa Muhammadiya, their gnosis-guided approach to Sharia, their mutual anti-establishmentarianism, uh, and their messianic end-time backdrop for their doctrines are key themes that bind their respective projects. Sha'arani's legal work has been proven novel and original. His reach has uh, an influence is still being discovered. Pagani shows that he was actually the most popular author in 19th century Damascus as well. The heavy borrowing from his work in the Rimah has important implications for the legacy of Sha'arani beyond Arab communities. This paper would like to point us to the fact that early Ottoman Egyptian works inspired one of the most important Sufi reform movements in modern West Africa, one that heralded the later arrival of the Faida of Sheikh Ibrahim Nias. So there are many ways in which these two authors were kindred spirits in the Velk sphere. He left ample, uh, Sha'arani left ample guiding gems in his literary corpus for Tal to activate as Tijani doctrine two centuries later. Sheikh Omar spent much of his life in the liminal space between us. Sheikh Omar Tal addressed scholars and laymen who may have perhaps disputed the validity of having a Sheikh while criticizing so-called excesses by certain Sufis in that time. Um, Sha'arani, two centuries prior, had almost an identical challenge and concern uh, in the milieu of early Ottoman Egypt. Less than a century later, Sheikh Ibrahim Inyas would read and retransmit the Rimah in his own writings, signifying both the timelessness of their edicts as well as their suitability for messianic sealing prescriptions. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Farah. This was great. And uh, it reminded me actually a lot of the polemics, um, reminded me a lot of um, Professor Zachary Wright's um, presentation yesterday as well. And it seems like this happened in Egypt in the 15th century, and then again in the 19th century, and then we're seeing it again in the 20th and 21st century. So this is clearly very important work that hasn't lost its relevance over centuries. Uh, so thank you for this really wonderful presentation. Um, I'm sure we have some questions uh, as well, um, but I'm going to ask everybody to hold them to the end um, because we want to make sure we can um, stay on track so we don't disrupt the next panel. Um, and so what I would like to do now is um, introduce our next speaker, uh, who is Umar Sheikh Tahir. He's a researcher on Islam in the West, currently a PhD student at the Department of Middle Eastern, South Asian and African Studies at Columbia University. And he's interested in the post-classical Islamic intellectual history of West Africa, scholarship, heritage and manuscripts. A founder of the Qadat al-Fiqh Foundation in Nigeria, who holds the chief missioner position, a member and representative of Sheikh uh, Dahiru Islamic Foundation in Quranic Curriculum Committee of Niger State Al Majiri Integrated Government Schools Project, an Imam and a teacher of Quran in Kar Karofi Jumat Mosque, and a member of Imams Forum Bauchi State. Omar is an academic working at the Department of Islamic Studies Bauchi State University, Gadao and has published six academic peer-reviewed papers, among which is Islamic Spirituality, Afkar of Tarbiya in Tijaniya Tradition, A Spiritual Journey to God. Omar holds his first degree from Al-Azhar University in Creed and Islamic Philosophy, and he accomplished a master's of Usuluddin at the University of Malaya, Malaysia, where he worked on Islamic intellectual history in the medieval ages. He samples Aristotelian logic incursion into Islamic theology. And his presentation for us today is titled The Epistemic Foundation of the Tijaniya in Quranic Verses of Dhikr, 
uh, analysis of Sheikh Dahiru Bauchi's commentary in Nigeria from the 1950s to 2020. Um, and so with that, Lamar, I'll leave the floor to you. Yeah, thank you very much for this wonderful uh, introduction. And thank you, uh, Farah, for your presentation. I will, uh, okay, that's great. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like to start by thanking Professor Usman Khan for his kind invitation and for the organizers that uh, work so hard to make this possible at uh, this critical time. And thank you very much for sharing your presentations to, to our all presenters. My paper is uh, a paper on epistemological foundation of Tizania in the Quranic verses analysis of Sheikh Tahiru Bauchi's tafsir commentary. Uh, actually, I, I developed uh, a bit uh, before it was 2020, but it is it became 2021 because Sheikh uh, actually uh, continue his tafsir this year, uh, very uh, 2021. So that made my paper become a bit uh, more developed to to about uh, the 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 thesis of uh, Sheikh Ibrahim Niyaz and Sheikh Tijani radiallahu ta'ala anhuma that uh, the 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 presented in uh, that uh, tariqat Tijaniya was established on the basis of Quran and Hadith. So Sheikh Tahir Bauchi, when he approaches the verses of tafsi of uh, Zikr in the Quran, so he used to relate these verses to campaign for what Sheikh Ibrahim Inyas has started uh, about the, the, the epistemic foundation of uh, Tijaniya in Quran and Sunnah. So the paper, uh, addressing this by analyzing Sheikh Tahir uh, uh, uh tafsir, which started uh, at the very early ages of his life, around his mid 20s. He started tafsir in a small community of, uh, of uh, Soro, small city, and then uh, around 1960s, start uh, the tafsir moved to to, to Bauchi, where the tafsir became large and started to become more and more uh, attracting to the people of Bauchi. And then uh, uh, around 1981, tafsir moves to Kaduna to become national tafsir and became well broadcasted by uh, the Kaduna uh, or Federal Radio Corporation and uh, it became widely known at the whole houses speaking communities of West Africa. So this is uh, the, the introduction of the, 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 the history of Tafsir and how it started. And about Sheikh, Sheikh was born in the city of Gombe so uh, in, on June 1927, and he started his schooling at home with his mother and then with his father, traveled to cities like Kano, Bauchi, Zaria to meet uh, uh, noble scholars there, such as Sheikh uh, Kafinga, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Tijani Emota, Sheikh uh, Atiku, all those Sheikhs of uh, Kano state and Sheikh Abdul Qadr, of course, in Zaria. But Sheikh marked his meeting with Sheikh Ibrahim as a of his intellectual journey, where he was looking for the knowledge of Marifa. When he came back after visiting Sheikh Ibrahim's parents to go to do Khidra, stays there for so, so long. And uh, so this is what he gave him a chance to become one of the Khulafa of Sheikh Ibrahim after spending time learning and doing khidma to Sheikh Ibrahim Inyas and being part of the uh, important uh, icon of movement of Faida in Nigeria, if I may call it movement. And uh, so the paper was uh, uh, intellectually shaped in this way so that Sheikh used the tafsir platform 
for extension of this religious message to reach as many people as possible. And Sheikh articulated what Sheikh Ibrahim Inya said, uh, that Tariqah was established on the basis of Quran and prophet tradition. So Sheikh used tafsir to make this uh, argument uh, more loudly and to, uh, to send this uh, message to the whole Muslim to, 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 to act accept the Tijaniya as, 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 the, as, as uh, a spiritual journey to God. And uh, this, as we know, all the, the Afri West African traditional of uh, Ramadan Tafsir, Tafsir is taking place in Ramadan and uh, Muslim use this a special message of God to mankind so that they can have their own share of uh, to, to come be, to, 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 to receive the message in their local language. So the Ramadan revealed, so people used to have these uh, sessions in Ramadan. So this is uh, culturally became part of the Islamic activities in West Africa, where you own any, uh, any radio station. Or, or. So, uh, Sheikh's methodology, uh, in his methodology, Sheikh used to uh, repeat the Quran after addressing the verse and interpreting it with the following methods. So he used to repeat the verse with the, with the, with the reciter. And then after that, because he's not holding Mus'haf or a book, any book of Tafsir, but uh, literally she had used to read a lot of books before coming to the floor and sometimes read books of Tafsir, mostly the mainstream uh, books of Tafsir and, and come to the floor while reading the all opinion of scholars and then following the steps of Tafsir by tradition with Quran and Quran that is the, uh, interpreting a verse from another verse in the Quran, and then following another tradition of prophet of hadith, uh, uh, prophetic hadith to uh, give more explanation into the verses. And, 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 and lastly, in his uh, methodology, followed by the uh, scholar's opinion. So in this, Sheikh used to be uh, following not only one mazhab as, uh, as the mazhab of, uh, of West African most uh, communities, which is mazhab al-Maliki. Sometimes he used to bring so many ideologies and uh, opinions from other mazhab in his uh, interpretations. And yeah, the tafsir is last for 50 minutes every day, every session. So at the end of the tafsir, there is a a 10 minutes dedicated for questions and answers where people offer questions mostly about Tijaniya and uh, Azkar and Islam in general. So people at these sessions came to accept Tijaniya, some people came to accept uh, Islam. So it is very uh, important to notice that Sheikh, when he came to the verses of a dhikr which is our topic today, he used to stay there yeah, and give more references using the uh, Tijaniya books from Tafsir, uh, insisting that all the Tijaniya activities were taken from Quran and Sunnah as Sheikh Ibrahim has already established in his books. Uh, so this is the verses of Zikr that has been selected here. So in this uh, section, I try to select uh, four categories of verses uh, as I, 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 I di divided the four activities of Tijaniya. First of all, I, I look at the, the initiation itself and the, the relationship between Sheikh and Murid and, uh, and uh, the spiritual journey to God. I, I give them uh, one category. So this one, is where Sheikh used these verses, especially the, the verses that I selected here, 
which Allah said, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, Inna hadhihi tadhkirah, Faman sha'a takhadha ila rabbihi sabila. So, Sadaqallah Allah, this verse is literally uh, followed a, some verses that came before this, talking about the vicar and its importance and the relationship between God and uh, servant in terms of spiritual communication by applying and zikr. So this verse literally was saying, this is an admonition, whoever will let him take a straight path to his God. So it's encouraging people, not saying this is an obligation that you have to take as uh, like uh, prayers or zakah or other Islamic pillars, but it's, uh, it's just telling you this as an encouraging you to initiate to yourself through a uh, spiritual journey to God, so which is Tariqa. So, Sheikh used to say that this verse of a place where God said, um, that the verse is saying, follow the, the roads or the, the path of those people that are near me, so that are awliya Allah salihin, so those awliya. So, in this occasion, Sheikh used to add this. So who are those people that you need to follow? He said, we can also employ a, a hadith from Holy uh, Prophet, which said, uh, the popularly known hadith, al-anbiya, the scholars that have been started by, by the messengers of God. So, so you, we see that how the verse links us to another verse, and the other, the, the the last one links us to the to the to the Holy Prophet tradition, where she came with this as a as a result of trying to 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 be uh, used as as evidence of initiation or the commitment between Sheikh and Murid uh, in Tijaniya activities. The second category of verses are the verses that discuss the Azkaru Sabah wal Masa, which is Lazmi, as we all know the, the activities. So this one, I selected this verse and I, I, I listened to the tape where Sheikh interpreted this verse. The verse is, وَذْكُرْ رَبَّكَ فِي نَفْسِكَ تَضَرُّعًا وَخِيفَةً وَدُونَ الْجَهْرِ مِنَ الْقَوْلِ بِالْغُدُوِّ وَالْآصَالِ وَلَا تَكُمْ مِنَ الْغَافِلِينَ This verse is saying, remember your Lord, or do a zikr, fi nafsika, remembrance, uh, uh, thy the very soul in your like uh, in your uh, in your heart with humility and reverence without loudness in words in the morning and in the evening and do not be though of those who are unheedful so this verse is literally given four elements or characteristics of of lazumi where people uh, the 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 Tijanian disciples is to recite this alone and do not talk while doing this askar and doing it in the morning and in the evening. And also they need to have specific uh, uh, reverence and be in humility before God. And the, the, the next uh, verse was taken from the verse of Jumu'ah or Surah Al-Jumu'ah, the verse, the verse 10 of uh, Surah Al-Jumu'ah after the initiation of the, the, the Muslims activity of Juma prayer, Sheikh uh, said that this verse is uh, given a Muslim like a time travel of his life on the day, on the Fridays. So if you, uh, the, the verse said, فَإِذَا قُضِيَتِ الصَّلَاةُ فَانْتَشِرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَابْتَغُوا مِنْ فَضْلِ اللَّهِ وَاذْكُرُوا اللَّهِ وَاذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ It says, when the Jumu'ah prayer finishes, disperse through the land and seek Allah's grace and remember Allah greatly so that you may be 
felicius. So this verse is literally giving us uh, the, 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 the activities of uh, Fridays and at the end of as much as you can. So, so this verse was assigned to the, uh, the Hailala of Juma. And lastly, this is the, the, the verse that I took to serve as a, as a foundational evidence of, uh, of Wazifa, which is Allah said, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu dhukuru Allah dhikran kathira. So this verse is literally saying, all those who believe, remember Allah in congregation with much remembrance. So this verse is saying that you, uh, the people, uh, oh, you believers. So it's asking believers, commanding them to do this uh, as car in congregation, which is the solid background of Tijaniya activity of uh, Wazifa. So as we can see, all these verses are commanding uh, the believers to, to do this uh, as car. So Sheikh used to give this and more uh, in more eloquent way of expressions so that people would understand the meaning of, of Tijani activities in the middle of anti-Tijani movements in Nigeria and in West Africa, especially the Salafi ideologies that, that, are, that exist uh, very powerfully around 80s and 70s. As, uh, so the initiation of seekers, Sheikh uh, used to give this, uh, as we know, the conditions of initiation, uh, the six uh, conditions. So, but one of the important things that Sheikh used to do is that, is sometimes he used to give tariqa remotely, saying that whoever listened to my voice can initiate into tariqa without uh, being attending here, being present, and without shaking my hand, which is literally uh, the, 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 the traditional way of initiating people into Tijaniya, but Sheikh uh, innovate uh, a new way of, of initiating people uh, by giving this. Uh, so people ask him, why are you uh, bringing something new into Tijaniya? He said, no, when we initiate women into Tijaniya, we literally not, don't shake their hand. So in that case, we can borrow this to initiate other people without shaking their hand, without being present uh, at a time of uh, initiation. So the check is literally uh, trying to link these activities by uh, giving so much uh, 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 evidences that support the Tijania activities and his propagation attracts people, uh, make people like attract, uh, be more attractive to Tijaniya and ask for more questions about Tijaniya because people don't really know what is happening in the Tijaniya because uh, the voice that are circulating outside or people that are talking about Tijaniya as they, they, they say things which are not things that related to Tijaniya or things that are not solely the activities of Tijaniya. So the activities of Tijaniya, as Shaq used to say, are only three, that is Azkaru uh, Sabah wal Masa, this is morning and evening, uh, Azikr, and then the Wazifa, and lastly, the, the Hailala of Juma. So these are the only activities of Tijaniya. Any other activities, are uh, just uh, social activities attached to Tijaniya, which are uh, just a uh, way of uh, uh, presenting the Tijaniya uh, activities. And uh, it is important to note that Sheikh made his tafsir as a, as a platform that he insists of making Tijaniya in the central activities of Muslims in Nigeria. And uh, by doing that, he's trying to do what uh, researchers call place making or present making of Tijaniya in the heart cities of Nigeria, because we know that in, in, in those uh, days, there are uh, so many attacks on, attacks on Tijaniya, especially from within the Sufi cycle and outside the Sufi cycle as well. So from within 
uh, the, 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 the time of mihna, whereby people have this uh, type of uh, very tough time with the other Europe uh, because the Tariqa Qadiriya So since he used to uh, uh, make his own uh, effort to make Tijaniya presence very loudly and matches in Nigeria. So where the Tafsir take the full dimension of being internationally broadcasted uh, to the to some other countries, not only uh, uh, Nigerian uh, uh, radio stations. So as of uh, now, we have this um, important uh, development of media. So Tafsir used to be la online, live. People can watch wherever they are. Uh, by following the pages in Facebook and uh, some uh, uh, media stations. Uh, so, so it becomes more, uh, more expansion now than before. And Sheikh refused all allegations against Sufi in general and Tijaniya in particular. Sheikh, this tafsir is one of the successful projects that supports separate of Faida and the continuation of the mission of Sheikh Ibrahim Inyas. The Sheikh's role model, Saib al -Faida. So all these, uh, uh, what Sheikh is doing is trying to make Faida and Tijaniya in general become more visible in Tijaniya, uh, in Nigerian societies. So at the end of uh, this, uh, inshallah, I will share with you a, a clip where we see how Sheikh demonstrate his uh, uh, tafsir, especially in the closing dates. So the closing ceremonies, it became part of the festivals in Kaduna State, in Kaduna City, where Sheikh attracts like a lot of people that are coming to listen to him and uh, became more, uh, more of uh, like uh, 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 celebrations, uh, especially at the day of uh, the closing ceremonies, which is taking place almost every year in the uh, like every year in, in 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 Ramadan, especially the this forty years because this year my the forty years in Gregorian in 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 like uh, this activity became more visible and more uh, of place making uh, of Tijani is in in Nigeria, especially around the time where we have this. Uh, problems of attacking from uh, these uh, uh, Salafism and uh, Saudi uh, em empowered uh, ideologies. And the Tafsir was one man project that started at uh, his mid age, uh, but uh, now it became a, the, the, the project of Faida in general, of uh, Islam in general, a being uh, a very important uh, platform for people to know Islam and to know Tijaniya in particular. And uh, yeah, as we know, uh, the Tafsir has got a break in, in last year where uh, because of COVID-19, uh, Sheikh uh, has to go back to Kaduna, uh, Bauchi to do his Tafsir there. But uh, that surprisingly, this year people are asking Sheikh, would you uh, would, would you get chance to come to continue the tafsir in Kaduna? So Sheikh surprisingly came and uh, and uh, and and continue his tafsir literally normal. And uh, yeah, here I, I would like to share uh, part of the this picture of Sheikh uh, in Bochi. And uh, here I would like to share the, the video. I don't know if I can, let me try and share this. So we can just uh, listen to the tafsir in Hausa language. This is ceremony of tafsir, about one, one minute. And then... I'm <laughs> 
أولادكم ولا أولادكم عن ذكر الله ومن يفعل ذلك فأولئك هم الخاسرون يا قوم مني ونبقى إيماني إلى الله نمزو أن صلى الله عليه وسلم ندعو أبنى النبي يزود شيء كركو يدى أموالكم ولا أولادكم قدو كيو ينبو كويا ينبو لا تلهكم كرس يقل تندكو أن ذكر الله جبرين أمبتم الله وبيجي يدنا كرامه ويوان تذكر الله واذكر الله كثيرا لعلكم تولهونا واذكر الله كثيرا لعلكم تولهونا وقام بشي الله ديوا دوك بزامو وبارو بيان الله جمو أم بشي ديوا أبون ديفر التامنا سلا بير أشكين أوا إشرين دهودو سلا بير إتش واجبا إن بكي أم بشي الله أشكين أوا إشرين دهودو أم بشي الله سيدان كدا Kau semua dah kata Allah yang kau semua ini kiri dia wa, dong muda mu mereka mu lara cewa jom muda yang muda bukai. Kau dah kata Allah yang turun muda bukai supaya yang sa, anak kira semua dia ini, wanda sa si jagora mu, aji ke iya wan terus kiri Allah. Kau kaya tu, kita mesti iya iya bila kamu min. Yes, we can see now this is a tafsir of Sheikh. Uh, his closing ceremony, Sheikh was saying the Turok uh, of Sufia by interpreting this verse of La Tulikum Amwalukum Wala Alwadukum Anzikrilla. So, so th this, this, this is the tafsir that became a uh, uh, very uh, national activities of uh, Muslims or festival, even in Kaduna state. Uh, I would like to stop here. Thank you very much for the listening and for watching the last clip. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you very much, Umar. This was fantastic. And uh, it's, it's a shame. I know those of you who are watching on the recording, um, it may be a bit spotty, um, but your recitation as well was really fantastic. Uh, and so I hope everybody who's able to come back and listen, you're able to catch that part. And the video is great. I, I love seeing some of these videos on WhatsApp and on YouTube of uh, scholars such as Sheikh uh, uh, Bahir uh, Bauchi and some others at Tijaniya Maulid and the end of Ramadan, you see stadiums filled up with thousands and thousands of people. Uh, and this was a really great example of just how important that work being done there uh, really is. So thank you very much. We really appreciate your work. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce our, our next two speakers. Um, the first is Aisha Khan, who is a graduate student at the Department of Religious Studies at the University of Cape Town, um, and also Dr. Andrea Brigalia, who is on the faculty of religious, uh, the Religious Studies Department at the University of Cape Town as well, and also the Department of Asia, Africa, and the Mediterranean at the University of Naples, L'Orientale. His research and teaching are focused on the area of Islam in Africa, with a special emphasis on West Africa, Nigeria, and on the role of Muslim scholars in the region's intellectual history. He has published or done research on the formation of scholarly networks in the Tijaniya Sufi order in Nigeria, Ghana, and Tunisia, on Quranic exegesis in Northern Nigeria, on 20th century religious literature in Nigeria, in both Hausa and Arabic, on manuscript collections in Abesh, Chad, on the ideological origins of Boko Haram. And their title um, for the presentation today is uh, The Nigeria Tijaniya Project, an assessment of the literary production of Fida in Nigeria. Um, so thank you very much for sharing your work with us and I'll leave the floor to you now. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, thanks a lot, first of all, to Professor Usman Khan for putting this together and also more personally for bearing with me for the miscommunication that uh, occurred during, du uh, due to my uh, change of affiliation during the preparation for, for this. So thanks a lot, Prof, for your patience. I've actually changed my affiliation, so I'm now affiliated to University of Napoli L'Orientale. Um, yes, um, what is our presentation about? Um, our presentation is about a project which we'll call the Night Teach Proj. Um, the Nigeria Tijania project, um, uh, which is about which I will talk for just one, um, one minute. Um, uh, first of all, the background, I will give the background. 
So the project is born actually many years ago, about 2000, it was about 2007 when Professor Rudiger Sesemann, who was at the time at Northwestern University, um, invited a number of us to collaborate on a project, a Ford Foundation project devoted to um, um, uh, the collection or sort of uh, uh, catalog uh, of uh, a biographical catalog of Tijani writings across a number of African countries. Uh, the project started and a number of people who are here these, during these days in this conference were involved for several countries. And uh, inshallah, we would like also to, to, to stress it's, it's, it's could, it could, it could, it could um, um, uh, uh, final, be finalized soon. Uh, but over the years, um, the, the Nigerian uh, uh, part of this project has also shown to be from the quantitative point of view, quite impressive. And uh, as I was in charge with the Nigeria section of this project, and uh, as I also had other um, smaller sources of funding during the years, I continued to work uh, relatively independently from the bigger project, although I was always, of course, giving Professor Sesemann some feedback about what was going on. Uh, so this is, let's say, the, the background. So let's say it's about 2007, it's about almost 15 years that this project has been going on. And, um, and this, is, this is it, basically. This is, this is, this is the Nige Teach project, is a number of field notes, uh, actual books written by Tijani authors from Nigeria, the overwhelming majority of which are associated with the Fida Tijania, um, uh, photocopies of books, um, information about books and about authors, uh, copies of uh, um, uh, theses devoted to these writers and these writings from Nigerian universities that have accompanied me, that have almost surrounded my working space for the last 15 years, although intermittent. Intermittently. During the last couple of years, Aisha Khan has collaborated decisively to put a little bit of order into that chaos. You know, Nigeria is a lot about chaos, about a very, very creative chaos, but sometimes, and, and we love it because of that, but sometimes if we want to, to be productive, we also need to put some order into our notes our collections, etc. So here, the input of Aisha Khan, a master's student at the University of Cape Town was decisive because he has helped me to create a um, actual database uh, from, um, from, uh, from, this, from this. So uh, the, in this presentation, we will um, um, uh, present, let's say the outcomes, the results of our database, stressing, um, mainly the quantitative aspects, but quantity is also important. Of course, when we want to go to the core of the Tijania and the Fida Tijania, we need some presentations like the ones by Oludamini on Ugunaike yesterday or Farah Sharif's today, just to mention two of those that I have in mind, more fresh in my mind, but not, not, not to say that other presentations were not equally going to the core. But sometimes, also, quantity is important to understand how the Fida Tijania as a religious movement or any other religious movement um, uh, 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 has, has functioned, uh, has grown, has developed over the years. So here I'm mainly interested in quantitative, not because I think that quantity is, of course, more important than quality. So we're interested also in cataloging, cataloging and documenting works that are not necessarily the most important ones from the point of view of uh, the Sufi doctrines that are being developed or from the point of view of the literary quality of the expression of, for instance, a poem. We're just interested with this particular aspect of the project to document how much, what, and perhaps to start asking questions about why Tijani authors have written in 20th century Nigeria. I must, uh, uh, so these are some of the, uh, most of the, uh, places, either some of them refer to a town, some refer to a region. So please don't, do not, do not uh, um, uh, bother too much about inconsistency. It's just to give you a sense of what is the regional expanse of the corpus we are looking at. I didn't visit personally all of these places. Most of them are not all. For some of them, I rely on secondhand information from uh, existing work being done by others. 
And last but not least, I should say this is dedicated to the person who has uh, lost uh, life uh, last year, exactly one year ago, it's Sheikh Malam Bashir Buhari of Kano. I must say that without him, none of this would have ever been possible. Each and every author of the Tijaniya I have uh, come across during my research, and you will see that there are quite a few. Um, I have done it because of his suggestions, because of his advice. If I were, uh, either because he and each and every one of the authors I have been personally in touch with, with, it was thanks to his words of introduction, starting from Sheikh Dahir Bauchi, about whom we have heard the last presentation, uh, to whom uh, Sheikh Madam Bashir Buhari introduced me in 1999. S uh, so this is in uh, his memory. Now let's go to the figures. We are looking at a corpus made about, of about 300 authors across Northern Nigeria and about almost 2000 titles across Northern Nigeria. The majority are from Kano, about 120 authors. So almost half of the corpus and about approximately 650 works, which means about one third of the corpus in terms of, uh, of, of writings. And of course, this is due to some um, uh, factors. Uh, the central place that Kano had in the development of the Feida Tijaniya in uh, Nigeria from the time of the four leading scholars belonging to the uh, network of the Salgawa, who, which was already one of the most influential religious Islamic networks in Kano at the time, who collectively almost with the distance of a few days from each other, they all affiliated to Sheikh Ibrahim Nyas and became the main pro promoters of the Faida in Nigeria. So of course, this historical reason justifies the fact that there is a massively, a, a superior, let's say, outcome from, from Kano then if compared to, to other regions. Uh, still, we believe that uh, there are also some circumstantial uh, reasons uh, that justify the fact that Kano has more output than other regions, which is the fact that I spent most of my time in Kano. So uh, as this is the Thai night teach proj at this stage, but it's uh, very probable that if more direct research is done, more extensive research is done on other areas of Nigeria, the quantitative numbers would be perhaps not equal, but at least let's say slightly more balanced. So this is the total, uh, as you can see about the corpus is made of about 124 authors and 661 titles from Kano. Then look at Borno. Borno, it's already striking. You have very few authors here that we have cataloged, but a high number of writings about 473. This is due certainly for those who are aware of the history of the Fayda Tijaniya in Nigeria to the presence of a number of authors, two or three authors, Sharif Ibrahim Saleh, Abu Bakr al-Miskin, who alone have about 200 writings, um, 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 which we are, we are listing. Anyways, I will not go necessarily into the details, uh, but um, this is uh, yeah, this is where you can see um, uh, a chart showing uh, Kano representing thirty five percent of the corpus in terms of uh, number of works, not in terms of number of authors. Borno about twenty five percent, twelve percent of Yoruba land. I was in Ilorin, I was in Ibadan, and I was in Legon, but I'm very sure that there's much more than I can. I can find from Yoruba land and, and, uh, and et cetera. So if these are the numbers, first of all, let's, uh, we want to ask, ask, answer this question. What does the Nijtij Proj add to previous quantitative estimates of the literary output of the Tijani scholars from Nigeria? We think that this, that quantitatively, we, have already, we are already able to give an answer and to provide and, and to say that our project was quite successful. In order to do that, we need, of course, to refer to Hanwick's volume two of his Arabic literature of Africa, which is the Bible of uh, uh, bibliography of African scholars writing in Arabic. Uh, according to the estimates that uh, Aisha has uh, quite patiently done by comparing every author we had a mention with 
with, uh, of course, um, uh, John Hanwick, whether it was present or absent. And every single entry that we had of writing by each author of our corpus with Hanwick, we can say that um, we are adding about 60% uh, to Hanwick of the Kano authors. And this for us is quite significant because the Kano Tijania author, author's chapter in Hanwick volume two is the second biggest chapter in the volume. It's about, now I can't remember, but a huge chapter is the second only to the Fodiawa, to the generation of the Damfodio. So if we are adding at about 60% only for Kano, it means that Basically, what we are saying after going through this corpus is that in quantitative, um, uh, in, a, in quantitative, uh, that from the quantitative point of view, I don't want to enter into comparison of quality that's very complicated. But in quantitative terms, the Fida Tijania revival was in the history of Northern Nigeria, a phenomenon that is comparable to the phenomenon of the Danfodio Jihad in the uh, beginning of the 19th century. So this is already what, what we can say. Of, for Borno, we are adding 70%. You can see the figures. You will be pro pro probably surprised by the 98% we are adding to Sokoto, Zampara, and Kebi. And this is not because we have um, found so many, too many authors and, and writings from that region, but it's just because that region was almost neglected by the uh, Hanwick project. There were almost no author from the Tijania uh, of Sokoto, who was uh, um, uh, uh, considered. Then we believe that we are not stopping at merely quantitative uh, analysis, though. We want to ask some questions about the nature of this Tijani corpus. What did they write? Why did they write? Uh, and so, uh, what do we contribute in this is mainly. Um, some of you, many of you know the uh, Hanwick's uh, catalog, which is, of course, outstanding. Without it, probably this conference would not have ever taken place. It's very outstanding. Uh, but one limit, if we want, is there's no um, um, uh, way of uh, uh, cataloging genres in a coherent way. So you really need to go through the catalog to have some estimates about what people were writing, what is the form of, and the content of this writing, uh, which is of course very important when we look at the catalogs. So we have tried to do that. And of course we know that uh, to, to identify genres and subjects is very controversial. It took us basically 15 years because I started to figure out what are the genres and what are the subjects when I started in 2007 and when we had long discussions with Professor Sezeman, with Professor Kahn, with Professor Zachary Wright, we're all involved into the original project. And I only devised a system that for me is working for my goals. It's not a universal system that I want to propose, but was only working for the goals of Aisha in her master's project. So we devised it together and she used it in her master's project only last year. So it took me about 14 years to do that. We um, identify a genre for our purposes, the formal aspects, thing that, that, that you can clearly recognize when you open a text. Uh, genres for us, it's not a universal definition of genres. I'm saying I used a functional definition. What do I need? What are the statistics that I need to know, that I want to know about, about this corpus? And from here, I devised a system to say, okay, these, I call them my genres. Poetry, so what appears as verses, prose, what appears, of course, as nathr, and rhymed prose, very important, what appears as, especially in the salawat genre, in the devotional genre, uh, as the rhymed prose of the Arabic tradition. And then commentary, because I was interested in which texts are derivative and which are not derivative. So it was important commentary like sharh, and we know that the sharh has a different format than a normal prose work because you will find, of course, the quotes usually highlighted in yellow in the older manuscripts of the original manuscript in the, in, and then your in black your text, or you will have uh, in the margins your sharh, things like that. Translations, I was very interested in knowing uh, what, what, what did they translate? How many translations are there? And anthologists who are also part of the derivative uh, group. 
Uh, and um, we find that the distribution of genres is more or less like this. So a striking uh, dominance of poetry, of verses, which of course we can easily, uh, we can easily understand where it comes from, the importance of the Madiah tradition, also from the ritual point of view, the importance of the Nulum tradition, or the versification, which I included into poetry, of course, for a lot of specialists of Arabic literature, Nulum, didactic verses are not really poetry, but I call them poetry because I'm interested in the form. Uh, whatever is verses for me is poetry. Perhaps then when I publish this, I can call it verses if my uh, uh, Arabic literature colleagues are happy with that. Uh, that is not my point. Uh, so, so Nulum, of course, then justify the fact that there's so much importance of poetry. But it is relevant still that we notice it because if we compare this corpus, for instance, with the corpus of, let's say, the Izala, the Salafi of Nigerians, there will be much less poetry. And these are important things, much less verses, even didactic verses. And these are important things to point out, I think, quantitatively. There are also times some differences that you find from one region to another. We have uh, in the thesis by Aisha, we have all these charts that she painstakingly uh, took from the database she collaborated to. Um, so for instance, translation on the, in the whole corpus is about 1%. But in Kano, it's about 4%. And in Yoruba land, it's 2%. So why? There's some reasons why. Uh, I could make examples for other of what we identify as the genre, but uh, let me do uh, one example with, 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 with translation. Of course, we have more translations in Kano because Kano was the center for the printing industry of books, which uh, were very popular in the 20th century, which popularized in Hausa, the curriculum of the ancient um, Majlis system. So virtually every book that was taught in the curricula, traditional curricula of fiqh, here we have an example of the Akhtaria, uh, an elementary introductory text in um, Maliki Fiqh that is here given in interlinear translation in Hausa Ajami. It's very recent work. So this was one reason why in Kano you have this printing industry. So it's in Kano that the printing industry needs translations to be devised. And so it's, it's, more, it's easier that they rely on Kano authors and translators to produce these works. Uh, as well as um, other ones like the Diwan. I have a two, at least two translations of the Diwan into Hausa. These are different types of translation. Uh, they are translations in printed uh, Latin script Hausa. Two translations, one very significantly is from a woman, Sheikha Hassan Sufi, who passed away a few, a few years ago in the 2010s and who was the Unfortunately, she is almost a single uh, occurrence in our corpus. Of these hundreds of authors, we have only one prominent one who is a woman. We have a few other women, just a handful of other women, uh, but they are not as prominent as Sheikh Hassan of Sufi. Sheikh Hassan of Sufi has a brilliant translation of the Diwan amongst many other works. Uh, as we can see, the two house of translations of the Diwan are different ones. So it's very nice also to work with translations and to see how different authors translated the same words of the Diwan of Sheikh Ibrahim Nyas. In Yoruba land, we have a few Yoruba translations, but one of the reasons why we have a slightly higher number than translations in Yoruba land if compared to other areas of Nigeria is that Yoruba authors translated a lot into English. Nigerian Tijani authors are the ones who wrote most of the English translations in this case of the Diwan by uh, Baba Taufik. And then we have subjects. And I know very well that a lot of those identified subjects might also be called genres. I know that very well, but I this devised this based on my purposes. I'm not sure how many minutes do I still have? Uh, five more minutes. Okay, fine. So it's enough to go through the subjects and subsubjects. So our purpose was, let us focus. We spoke about that a lot with Aisha and I was, I'm sorry, Aisha, before you completed your, your thesis, I was almost driving her crazy by changing the system of identifying subjects and subsubjects and genres over and over again for a whole corpus of thousands of writings. 
Uh, but I think that in the end, we found out a, a good system. I know that some of them might be called genres. And in fact, in the monograph that I would want to write, inshallah, in the coming years, I will call them genres. And it's not an inconsistency. It's the fact that for this more quantitatively oriented uh, work, I needed really to have a, a definition, a sort of uh, categories that I could quantify that had to do with the, the form, ontology, poetry, prose, rhyme drums is purely formal, and others that had to do with content. So we have eulogy, also divided in a number of um, um, uh, sub-subjects. Of course, there are many more sub-subjects, but what we wanted to know, what Aisha and I wanted to know is how many Madiyah of the Prophet have been written? How many of Sheikh Ahmad Tijani? How many of Ibrahim Inyas? Of course, there will be uh, also uh, Madiyah of uh, plenty of Nigerian scholars, but we didn't create a separate sub-subject for that. Devotional, and I created four sub-subjects. It was no time to go into that, but there's a reason why I chose these ones. Sufism, jurisprudence, elegy, Tijaniya is separate from Sufism because we wanted to know how many generic works on Sufi themes have been written and written and how many works that dealt with the doctrines, the practices or the defense of the Tijaniya. With ethics, we identified everything that comes in the category of Adab or also Waz poetry, poetry that is mainly of the traditional Waz or homiletic um, um, style, uh, yes, uh, content. We have occasional ones, very important part of the, of the corpus as well, and a number of other ones. I can't go through all of them, uh, but when we look at the overall distribution of subjects, we see that eulogy has the biggest share, and again, we can give a lot of answers for that. Uh, answers that perhaps um, 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 will also uh, push, as I hope, from a first catalog to be produced, more quantitative one, push to a second one that I have in mind, which is a monograph, as well as then devotional comes second, Sufism comes third, more or less the same, jurisprudence, etc. So there's a few questions that one might ask when looking at this corpus, why so little hadith? It's, I don't think it's surprising. All these scholars belong to networks where hadith was studied, memorized. But the idea at the time when the Fayda Tijaniya boom emerged, when the Fayda the, the, the Tijani flood started, was that there was no reason to revise, to review, or sorry, to review this, this corpus. That the hadith scholarship was finished. It's only after the beginning of the Salafi critique in Nigeria that the idea that there's some original works that can be done on hadith um, um, start to take roots in Nigeria today. At that time, um, so the absence of works on a subject does not mean that the subject was not studied. On the contrary, there was a lot of devotion to hadith. Perhaps if we want, we can say excessive devotion to, the, to hadith meant that so little was written because devotion sometimes also mean that, okay, that body of knowledge for me is finished. I can't do, put anything anymore uh, into it. Um, yes, so uh, this, this is the overall distribution of subjects. We have also discrepancies at times from one region to another. There's a lot we could say, of course, but um, I can't go into all the details. I'll uh, perhaps give one example uh, with the fact that, uh, oh yes, just as an example of what kind of work, when we see eulogy, of course, eulogy, madia can mean a lot of things, can mean madia in Arabic, in Hausa, in Yoruba, can mean madia also of very different length. To the left, we have an alfiya, al alfiya al nadifiya is a poem by Sheikh Abdul Wahid al nadifi um, of uh, al karmawi of Kano, who is alive, and in fact, very, very vibrant these days. He's an, it's an alfiya, it's a long poem. Writing a madih of the poet, or the Prophet Sallallahu in this case, is writing a long poem where a lot of details about his life are being given. On the right, more common perhaps, is a short poem, a short Hausa poem um, of a few uh, um, pages. But for us, it's interesting to document as well uh, because in the expressions that are used, there might be some interest or also in knowing the very fact that for every Maulid in a remote village 
somewhere in the area of Katsina, there was a scholar who found it useful to write a new poem on the prophet and that every maulid, so basically maybe he had 50, 50 poems uh, to his credit because every year in that village, there was a maulid gathering when all the Tijanis were meeting and the sheikh was reciting a new poem. For us, this is relevant. Even if this author is obscure, was not known besides his village, etc. because this type of literature gives us a sense of the social life of the Zawiyas, which is the ways which we, which, with which I will conclude. Um, there was a last section, um, uh, but I don't have uh, time, or perhaps maybe, do I have time for the very last example? 30 seconds, perhaps. perhaps. Sure, 30 seconds, go ahead. Just to make that last example, we see other places like when we look at Yobe, uh, the area of Yobe, we find that devotional works are, are uh, uh, have a big, the biggest share, which is not necessarily the case as elsewhere. So sometimes you need to know about the life of individual figures in the Nigerian Tijaniya to justify these differences. So in Yobe, the reason is that we had in the city of Guru, Sheikh Muhammad Gibrima, who was um, an outstanding scholar, uh, or one of the Khulafa of Sheikh Ibrahim in Nigeria, who was known mainly for his works on um, the Salawat on the Prophet, which are according to me, but also to people who know much more about the genre of the Salawat on the Prophet than me, perhaps the most beautiful examples from the last few centuries of works of Salawat. He wrote many, uh, Sheikh Ibrahim himself loved them, uh, and uh, they are mainly in uh, um, rhymed prose, so this is the reason why when you go to look at the figures of Yobe, you find there's more rhyme prose than poetry perhaps, and there's more devotional works than, than perhaps eulogy or others. Anyways, I will stop here um, and thank again, and this is not as a stress again in conclusion, not my work, but it is the work that Aisha and I have done and that this work would never have been done without the collaboration of so many uh, Nigerian scholars and their students, all of whom are for me summarized by one person, Sheikh Bashir Buhari, to whom this talk is dedicated. Through him, I'm paying homage to all of the people who have contributed to this over the years. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Begalia. This is really incredible. And what a monumental work that's going to be a, a huge service to scholars, but then also the Faida itself in Nigeria and beyond. I have lots of questions myself because this opened up so many things for me, but I'll have to send you an email uh, about those later because I want to make sure we have time for uh, our next presentation, which is uh, from Adnan Adrian Wood who is a second year PhD student in the study of religion at Harvard University, whose research focuses on the poetry of Sheikh Ibrahim Nyas and his followers, and on the significance of poetry to Sheikh Ibrahim's Faida movement. Adnan has translated several poems of Sheikh Ibrahim and his students, as well as selections of their prose work, and oversaw a project to describe the entire poetic corpus of Sheikh Ibrahim and selective English translations in a searchable and easily navigable format. He has spent time within communities of the Faida in Senegal and Mauritania, where he intends to do his field work. Adnan served as the Muslim chaplain at Brown University for five years and has taught Arabic at Zaytuna College in Berkeley, California. His presentation for us today is entitled Zayd of the Faida Muhammad Ibn al-Sheikh Abdullah and his compilations. Uh, so Adnan, we'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Ayudeji. Um, I presume can you I just get a thumbs up that you can hear me? Okay, perfect. Uh Bismillahi Rahman Rahim, Walhamdulillahi was uh Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Adameen, was salatu was salamu ala Rasulim Kareem. Uh thank you once again, Ayudeji and Professor Khan for this overall conference. Welcome everyone, salamu alaikum, Ramadan Mubarak. I just want to say before I, I begin the presentation, I just want to acknowledge as several others have done over the past few days that this conference is full of people who I consider my mentors, teachers, inspirations, um, both amongst the conference participants and in um, some of the attendees here too. Uh, and so it's really humbling um, to be part of this conference and, and thank you Professor Khan for asking me to, uh, to present some of this research. In a letter he sent out in the early 2000s to the global Faida community, Sheikh Ahmed Tijani Ibrahim Nias, the official representative 
or Khalifa of Sheikh Ibrahim's family, said these words you find on the screen in front of you. With this, the Khalifa conveyed a message he often repeated throughout his life, the dire need for the legacy of Sheikh Ibrahim to be preserved before it was too late, before those who had direct experience with him had passed away. He also singled out Muhammad ibn Sheikh Abdullah as the pen of Sheikh Ibrahim's failure and likened his role in preserving its legacy to the role played by the Moroccan Ahmed Sukhadij with respect to the Tijani order. This analogy came from Ibn Sheikh Abdullah's effort to compile the biographies of Sheikh Ibrahim's major muqaddams or authorized representatives mirroring Sukhadij's works on the companions of Sheikh Tijani. However, that three volume biographical compilation represents a fraction of the work Ibn Sheikh Abdullah has done to preserve Sheikh Ibrahim's legacy. He has also written a lengthy biography of Sheikh Ibrahim, a full commentary on Sheikh Ibrahim's first didactic poem, a six volume transcription of Sheikh Ibrahim's Quranic exegesis, a rebuttal of anti faida polemics, an exposition on Sufism in general, an exposition on the Tijani path of Sufism in particular, two volumes on the life and works of his own father, a muqaddam of the faida, a two-volume collection of Sheikh Ibrahim's entire poetic corpus, and three volumes of poetry written in praise of Sheikh Ibrahim. Not only this, but he is currently compiling an authoritative collection of the entirety of Sheikh Ibrahim's prose works, which could span more volumes than the entirety of what he has published to date. Unlike almost all the other printed works of Sheikh Ibrahim that circulate in West Africa, Ibn Sheikh Abdullah's publications are printed on sturdy paper with strong binding and edited meticulously, with arata either corrected by hand using whiteout and penning, or laid out in a chart affixed to the inside front cover of a work. Though, as we heard from Sheikh Fakhri on Thursday, that does not mean his works are flawless. Alhamdulillah, perfection is only for God, as we say. The works of his regarding Sheikh Ibrahim's legacy typically include a narrative about how the representative of Sheikh Ibrahim's family at the time, encouraged Ibn Sheikh Abdullah to undertake the project at hand, as well as a formal authorization from that representative and an acknowledgement of the other scholars who served as research associates and co-editors of Ibn Sheikh Abdullah. Therefore, the role Ibn Sheikh Abdullah has played in preserving what we now consider to be the writings of Sheikh Ibrahim may be light likened to that of Zayd Ibn Thabit, the young companion of the Prophet Muhammad, who was tasked by successive political inheritors of the Prophet وسلم, to compile an edition of the Quran that would henceforth be the single authoritative written text for the entirety of the Prophet's global community of followers. Prior to Zayd's work, عن, the Quran's primary mode of preservation was oral, and the few written copies that existed tended to be both full of errors and incomplete. Prior to Ibn Sheikh Abdullah's projects, Sheikh Ibrahim's teaching and writings were either transmitted through copies of audio recordings and handwritten manuscripts or collected piecemeal in poorly edited publications. After the passing of Sheikh Ibrahim, this humble man's influence over one of the most popular contemporary Sufi revivalist movements is unparalleled. Our contemporary understanding of Sheikh Ibrahim and his legacy is thereby, thereby mediated by and indebted to this Zaid of the Fela, and the research I present today attempts to fill the lacuna of scholarship on him and his writings. Besides offering an overview of Ibn Sheikh Abdullah's publications, I will analyze his editorial choices both within each work and in terms of his overall decisions of projects to prioritize. The ordering of his, of his four major projects reflects both an attentiveness to the documentary needs of the Fela community in order of priority and a reflection of key methodological themes of the movement. Ibn Sheikh Abdullah's scholarship is therefore significant not only because it preserves elements of Sheikh Ibrahim's legacy in an authoritative manner, but also because it reinforces the movement's methodology and its understanding of itself. tafsir al Quran al Karim, in the meadows of tafsir of the Noble Quran, is Ibn Sheikh Abdullah's first multi volume work, completed in 2010. It is a transcription of one of the last instances of complete oral exegesis that Sheikh Ibrahim gave in 1964. It spans six volumes, though you might notice on this slide that volume three was on loan to a friend when we took this picture. 
In both Sheikh, Sheikh Ibrahim's content and Ibn Sheikh Abdullah's editorial choices, the theme of Sheikh Ibrahim's vicegerency to the Prophet Muhammad, his khidafa, and his resulting consummate scholarly authority is paramount. Ibn Sheikh Abdullah's decision to undertake this transcription, this transcription project first is telling. Out of all of Sheikh Ibrahim's writing and speeches, many of which were more influential and in dire need of proper editing and dissemination, his Quranic exe exegesis has symbolic value within its scholarly context as the kind of work that only the most highly accomplished and authoritative scholars would dare to produce. Sheikh Ibrahim's tone in the tafsir is one of authority and prophetic inheritance. Sheikh Ibrahim quotes from or alludes to countless works of scholarship throughout the centuries and throughout the Muslim world, and he narrates from memory mostly over 6,000 hadiths in the course of his lectures. He also demonstrates his scholarly authority by correcting key works of classical scholarship, often with a sense of humor, as in this example on the slide, thus situating himself as a defender and inheritor of the prophetic mantle. Muhammad ibn Sheikh Abdullah follows Sheikh Ibrahim's tone in this regard with respect to his editorial choices and commentary. The portrait he paints of Sheikh Ibrahim in his introduction is of a consummate prophetic inheritor and he frames the tafsir as a sui generis work that displays Sheikh Ibrahim's access to knowledge beyond the reach of any other scholar. He includes at the end a taqrib or laudatory appraisal for the tafsir, which speaks of Sheikh Ibrahim as the quote, unique true inheritor of the prophetic mantle who receives his understanding from the archangel of revelation himself. The concept of Sheikh Ibrahim's vicegerency to the prophet is a theme he and his students take up throughout their works. In his poetry, Sheikh Ibrahim makes it explicit that he is the vicegerent of the Muhammadan reality for his time, having become so enraptured in the Prophet's presence that there is no longer any distinction between them, as uh, Ulu Damani uh, pointed out so beautifully and so well on Thursday. According to one of his senior students, quote, even if the physical form necessitates that they be considered two separate people, the only difference between them is the difference between the white and black parts of the eye. Monographs such as Zachary Wright's Living Knowledge in West African Islam and others have also elucidated this point as a feature of the discourse of the Fayda. Although several defining themes of Sheikh Ibrahim's Fayda movement can be noted in the tafsir, the theme of vicegerency looms large in it. Thus can Firiyad al-Tafsir be understood not only as a project to disseminate Sheikh Ibrahim's interpretation of the Quran to his students, but as a proof for his claims to prophetic inheritance and unparalleled scholarly acumen, thus presenting a foundational argument for why Sheikh Ibrahim is so important. Two years after the publication of Firiyad al-Tafsir, Muhammad ibn Sheikh Abdullah published five volumes under the title Majmu'at al-Ta'rif, the Sheikh Ibrahim radiallahu an wa fayyatihi wa muqaddimi, a collection introducing Sheikh Ibrahim, his flood, and his muqaddams. A sixth work was later appended to the collection. The first volume, Mada Ani Sheikh Ibrahim, What Is It About Sheikh Ibrahim, is a hagiography of Sheikh Ibrahim that aims more to paint a picture of who he was than to give an account of his life history. Ibn Sheikh Abdullah uses the conclusion of the work to discuss the importance of having a spiritual guide and what the ideal relationship between a guide and their student is. Another three volumes in the collection are entitled Rijal wa Adwar fi Bil Sahib al Fayda Tijaniya, Distinguished Personalities and Roles in the Shade of the Owner of the Tijani Flood, comprising Al Milaf al Senawali, Al Milaf al Muritani, and Al Milaf al Ghar Tifriqi. The Senegalese volume covers 70 muqaddams and others who served Sheikh Ibrahim, as well as a history of two villages with particular importance to the Fayla, Taibin Yasen and Daru Mbitian. The Mauritanian volume includes over a hundred muqaddams, a discussion of the misguidance that some of Sheikh Ibrahim's purported followers have fallen into after his passing, and a special section on the muqaddam Sheikh Ibn Khayri and the quote, luminaries around him. The West African volume also covers over 100 muqaddams with an appendix on the reception of Sheikh Ibrahim's published tafsir in which Ibn Sheikh Abdullah records his thoughts on the work's significance and the generous appraisals it received. Two other works are part of this collection. One is Muram al nukhab fi Ta'seel wa Ruh al-Adab, the aspiration of the elect noting the sources of the spirit of good morals, which is not only a gloss of the first poem written by Sheikh Ibrahim, 
but also notes other scholarly corroborations of its content. Finally, Alam fi dhil sahib al fayda Luminaries in the Shadow of the Owner of the Flood, is a brief volume appendix to the collection several years later, comprising 29 biographies that were not ready in time to be included in the initial collection, as well as commendations for the biographical collections and the collection that I will mention next. Human presence is a unifying theme for at least five of these works, i.e. the biographical collections. Even the work that seems not to fit under this theme, the commentary on Ruh al-Adab, appears more congruous with the others when considering how Ibn Sheikh Bala frames it. In his introduction, he characterizes Ruh al-Adab not just as an important poem, but as a textual representation of its author's being, quote, a sheikh in all its perfection. By framing the relationship between poem and author thus, Ibn Sheikh Abdullah explains for us how an analysis of Ruh al-Adab is essentially a biography of Sheikh Ibrahim. This, this six volume collection thereby presents a key component of the Fader's methodology, that of Hadra or Suhba, reliance on embodied interpersonal connections to transform human souls and let the flood flow through them which Sheikh Ibrahim and others within the favor present as a pillar of spiritual transformation. After establishing the scholarly authority of Sheikh Ibrahim and his prophetic inheritance through the publication of his tafsir, it would have been natural for Ibn Sheikh Abdullah to work on authoritative editions of other writings and speeches of Sheikh Ibrahim. But he instead devoted his energy to documenting what he saw as the true receptacles of Sheikh Ibrahim's guidance and wisdom, the humans who ushered in this divine flood and served as its conduits to others, namely Sheikh Ibrahim and the Muqaddams that he said would serve as, representative, as representations of him. Published in the same year as the biographical collections is a four volume collection by Ibn Sheikh Abdullah that lacks an overall title, but whose unifying theme is an exposition on Sufism in general and the Tijani Tarifa in particular. First, Uyata Sufi Min Khidaz Sufiyati the identity of the Sufi by way of his Sufism is a detailed treatment of the foundations and practices of Sufism in general. A second book in the collection, Abwa'un ala asalati wa fiqhi tarifa tijaniya, spotlights upon the Tijani tarifa's firm grounding and its jurisprudence, takes up the conditions, practices, and beliefs of the Tijani tarifa. It is the longest work in the collection and an invaluable resource for both introductory material as well as the specific practices and concepts that distinguish Sheikh Ibrahim's favor movement. A third book, Ar-Raddu bil Hadithi wal Quran, ala ma fi kitab mayghini nijiri min azuri wal buhtan, a rebuttal by means of Hadith and Quran to what the book of the Nigerian Maghari contains of falsehood and slander, is a detailed defense of the Tijani Tariqa. It was originally written a few years prior, but Ibn Sheikh Abdullah prepared a second edition and included it in this collection. Although it is a direct response to a single work, Ibn Sheikh Abdullah's comprehensive treatment of the subject matter anticipates major doubts and accusations that could be raised against Sheikh Ibrahim and his favor and offers a full rebuttal. A final fourth book included in this collection, in this collection is Tajni'u Ta'liq, Compilation and Commentary, a brief work containing the mystical poetry of Ibn Sheikh Abdullah's father, Sheikh Abdullah, a prominent Mauritanian muqaddam of Sheikh Ibrahim. The book also contains as an appendix a full transcript of Sheikh Ibrahim's 1967 speech to his followers in Alag, Mauritania. It is in the introduction to the appendix that Ibn Sheikh Abdullah reveals how Tajmiya wa Ta'anif matches the theme of the other three books in the collection. He presents Sheikh Ibrahim's Mauritanian address as, quote, the comprehensive constitution for the conduct of the Muslim and notes that the reason he was able to give such a speech in Mauritania was because of the progress that his students had made in their spiritual wayfaring at the hands of Sheikh Abdullah. This means that the primary function of this last book is to showcase what embodiment and application of Sheikh Ibrahim's systematic approach to the Tariqa looks like through the poetry of one of its most accomplished practitioners. Ibn Sheikh Abdullah's systematic approach to the material in this collection clearly takes inspiration from what he sees as Sheikh Ibrahim's law or kanun of systematic organization to which Ibn Sheikh Abdullah devotes a full chapter in his biography of the Fayda's founder. Even without his identification of this methodological theme of the Fayda, we can note it in the systematic way that Sheikh Ibrahim outlines progress in the mystical path in the various places that he does, and in his ability to build his own village, 
maintain an expansive agricultural operation in Senegal and create a network of representatives, non-governmental organizations and edu educational institutions that enabled him to reach tens of millions throughout West Africa. By publishing these four volumes after the five volumes of biography and before that, the six volumes of Tafsir, Ibn Sheikh Abdullah elucidates the systematic approach that Sheikh Ibrahim offers to his followers. While the previous two collections make the case for Sheikh Ibrahim's qualifications and prophetic inheritance, and then emphasize the need to understand him and his movement by way of embodied connections, this collection gives specific guidance on how to make that connection and why. The latest collection completed by Ibn Sheikh Abdullah is titled Afaq al Shir, The Horizons of Poetry, as we've heard before and contains five volumes, two volumes covering Sheikh Ibrahim's entire poetic corpus and three volumes of poetry written about Sheikh Ibrahim. The two volume, Afaq al-Shir, and the Sheikh Ibrahim Nias, The Horizons of Poetry with Sheikh Ibrahim Nias, starts with a general introduction and comprises 20 separate diwans of Sheikh Ibrahim's poetry, totaling 514 poems altogether. About half of these diwans are panegyrics or madih for the Prophet, as Sheikh Fakhri has mentioned, and the rest include madih for Sheikh Ahmed Tijani, madih for Sheikh Ibrahim's teachers and contemporaries, intercessory prayers by use of Quranic acrostiches, didactic poems, travelogues, and miscellaneous poems and fragments of poetry that Sheikh Ibrahim is known to have authored. The other three works in the collection are the two volume Athaq al Shi'ar fi Sheikh Ibrahim Nias, Shu'ara Mauritaniyun Madah al Sheikh Ibrahim Nias. The Horizons of Poetry about Sheikh Ibrahim Nias, Mauritanian poets who have praised him, and a single volume of Shu'ara Atharika, Medical Sheikh Ibrahim Nias, African poets who have praised him. The first volume of the Mauritanian collection includes poetry from 55 poets, some from elsewhere in the Arab world, such as the famed Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish, all of whom did not officially enter Sheikh Ibrahim's Fayda but composed panegyrics for him nonetheless, and 44 Mauritanian poets of the Fayda. The second volume includes the poetry of 11 more prolific Mauritanian poets of the Fayda, including Ibn Sheikh Abdullah himself and his father. As for the African volume, it includes the work of 41 poets, mostly from Nigeria and Senegal. These five volumes of poetry compiled by Ibn Sheikh Abdullah display what Sheikh Ibrahim's Sufi methodology aims to inculcate in his followers, ma'rifa, or divine gnosis, which results in love for veneration of and service to God, the Prophet and his inheritors. Ibn Sheikh Abdullah dwells on these themes in his introductions, and even though he opens his collection of Mauritanian poets with panegyrics from poets who did not join Sheikh Ibrahim's movement and follow his methodology, he frames their work as ultimately the results of and testimonies of Sheikh Ibrahim's love and esteem for those poets, which arose out of his love for the language of his beloved Prophet, peace upon him, and his love for the Prophet's descendants, who make up the majority of the poets included. Therefore, this latest collection showcases the fruits of connecting to Sheikh Ibrahim in the way that this previous collection comprehensively outlined. By surveying the four multi-volume collections he has completed so far, we can note Muhammad Ibn Sheikh Abdullah's intentional ordering of his projects to preserve the legacy of the Fayla. He started with establishing Sheikh Ibrahim's scholarly acumen and divinely inspired prophetic inheritance through his transcription of Sheikh Ibrahim's tafsir to demonstrate how to benefit from and understand this Khalifa he focused on the embodiment of the movement in Sheikh Ibrahim's person and his various muqaddams and detailed his systematic Sufi methodology by which one is to establish and maintain one's affiliation to him. He then showcased the benefits and fruits of affiliation to Sheikh Ibrahim. Ibn Sheikh Abdullah's works thus reinforced these themes that define the character of the movement overall. To conclude, more research and analysis of Ibn Sheikh Abdullah's contributions remains to be done particularly because, of his, because his contribution is by no means over. As the Fayla continues to expand worldwide, Ibn Sheikh Abdullah's contribution to it is poised to expand as well. For him, however, his accomplishments are not but a desire to be of service, as he states in one of his poems in the final collection. Ya Sayyidi, inni uhibbukum ajal, wa dhaka ma la abdaghi bihi badal, wa laysa li ibadatun wa la amal, siwa raja waslin liman bika tasal, Oh my Lord, I love you indeed. That is something for which I desire no substitute. I have no worship nor action to call my own, but a wish of reaching one who has you reached. I have no hope for anything but your good pleasure. If you are pleased, then the aim has occurred in full measure.
Thank you. Uh, well, thank you so much, Adnan. This was really great. Um, and thank you also for uh, your great work in getting us back on schedule. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, and this, these two um, previous talks have really been great in getting us ready for the importance of poetry um, and the recitations that we're going to have at the end uh, of the whole conference. So this is a wonderful way to prepare us for that. Um, well, that will conclude this panel. Unfortunately, we don't have time uh, for questions because we don't want to intrude too much on the next panel that's coming up. Mm -hmm.